the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cap episode 800 for Monday, February 3rd, 2020. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions, your cool stuff found, your tips, all that stuff. We mash it all together. We come up with the answers. Sometimes we have them. Sometimes you have them. The goal is, as we go through this every week together, for every single one of us, us included, all of us, we're all the same here, for every single one of us to learn at least five new things. Every time we get together sponsors for this episode include uh, a, a, a longtime sponsor of the show PDF pen 11 from smile at smilesoftwarecom slash podcast and a new sponsor of this show, although not a new company to this show zapier.com slash M G G. We'll talk a little bit more about each of those later, but you can go visit those links now if you want to, you know, get a little jump on things for now here. For the 800th time, although I haven't done all 800 of them here, but for the 800th time doing this show in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John O'Brien. 800. Well, yeah. How'd know, that happen? It's like the only start. It's, it feels like we started doing this just yesterday. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I mean, so eight hundred. It's like you know, I thought about a lot of different themes for this. You know, there's the the octet theme. There is the 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 one eight hundredth time we do this together, right? Like, I, I kind of like that one. That was sort of fun. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, otherwise it's it's like we just keep keep doing what we do. Like that's that's kind of what I love about this show is that we just keep doing what we do, and everybody seems to get helped by it and all of that stuff, which is which is what makes it. Yeah. This is make makes it fun. Yeah. We could uh we could scream this is podcast, but that's 300. Right. That's right. <laughs> uh, one of the people in one of my feeds had uh, uh he went to a club and yeah it was like club 300 and so he was like posting pictures of everything saying this is whatever. Yeah, right. Right. Sparta. Like you know. Yes, right, right. Yeah, no, I yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good reference. I like it. <laughs> I don't know, man. You know what I do know? I know we should just let's dive in. Why not? We got a lot of stuff to talk about today. We, we have, of course, like I said, you know, we've got the questions. We've got cool stuff found. We have some quick tips, but I, I don't know if, if we may save those for the next show. We might get to them in the show. We'll see. Uh, you've got some new toys. I've got a rant or two to share. So let's do it. And we'll start with Andrew, who says, uh, I'm writing because I encountered an issue for which I am at a loss to explain. I present frequently in various different venues. And because of that, I carry with me a wide range of dongles so I can connect my new 16 inch MacBook pro or whatever other laptop I have to whatever projector winds up being in the room. Uh, yesterday says I plugged into the projector system using Apple's Thunderbolt three slash USB C to HDMI adapter. And the projector would not see the computer. It showed no signal. The computer, however, showed that it saw a projector on the other end. He says, I tried unplugging, replugging different USB-C ports, nothing. Uh, he says he also tried changing. And this is a good tip. Uh, actually, just helped my son deal with this for a presentation he was doing the other day. Uh, when the computer sees the projector and the projector doesn't see the computer, go to the projector and change the HDMI input. Uh, for that or whatever input, because sometimes the projector might not be on the one that that you're on, especially if it's one of these sort of conference rooms with a detached system. Um, he says later, I tried that same Apple dongle on a regular HDMI TV and it worked fine. And the previous day I'd used it with a projector at a different venue and it worked fine there, too. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the adapter, he says. Do you have any idea uh, why? Oh, and then he says, uh, I tried a different USB-C to HDMI adapter. He says a much cheaper off-brand one, and it worked fine. I unplugged it, tried the Apple one again, and it still didn't work. So he says, do you have any idea why this might be the case? I've had similar experiences before with my previous MacBook Pro, the 2013 model, 
And in some cases, I couldn't connect with the built-in HDMI port, but was able to connect with a mini display port to HDMI dongle. Again, some off-brand one. He says, in each case, I think the issue occurred in a larger venue where the Mac was connecting not to a single projector, but to a system that then linked to the projector, which is fairly common in like college classrooms and things where, where it's, you know, a little like the AV is sort of. Uh, the, it built into the infrastructure, not just, you know, wheeled in on a cart or whatever. Uh, it says it probably seems like a small issue. He says, but my livelihood depends on being able to present slides to audiences. So I'd like to understand what is happening. Yeah, this is a weird one. I I've run into, you know, I present enough, probably not quite as much as Andrew here, but I, I've run into weird things before. And I, too, have learned to carry a variety of things to solve that problem. Uh, because you know, you, you wanted any good presenter should be able to, uh, do their stuff without slides, but sometimes like it's really helpful to be able to show something visually instead of just talking about it. So says the podcaster that does an audio show. Uh, but, but you know, it, so yeah, it, it, like it's good to hedge your bets and be ready. You know, I, I'm long time boy scout here. Always be prepared. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know why Apple's adapters work differently from the third party ones. I would be curious in his specific example to plug both in. You know, I, I, I always head down the path of what would I do if it were me and I were there. Right. So plug them each in and look at system profiler and see how they show up, you know, is one showing up as a Thunderbolt device is one showing up as a USB device. How do they present themselves to the system that might kind of give us a little more insight, which might give us the answer. Uh, Brian Monroe in the chat room is suggesting maybe it's an HDCP issue, which is the copy protection built into HDMI. That's possible. There is a negotiation that happens with HDMI signals. And perhaps Apple is being more aggressive about that with their chips than third parties feel the need to be. That would not surprise me. In fact, that's the, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, that interesting. Uh, that could well be it. And, and to solve that, of course, you do exactly what Andrew did. You have multiple adapters with you. So thoughts on that, John? Um, the one thing that I found sometimes may convince something to be seen when it's not is that if you go to system preferences, displays, and you hold down the option key, you will then get a detect displays button that couldn't hurt to try that. And maybe that'll convince something to wait up or sync. I know he said he, he, he the computer saw it, but right. sometimes I found that explicitly saying detect displays will kick some things into gear so I, that's not a bad idea i like that yeah yeah good call man right yeah and that's that's just another one of those good things to to remember you, you know there's that sort of series of troubleshooting steps you go through in the moment when you plug in the projector into your mac and you're like oh crap it doesn't show up I'm like okay i what i wish is that i could tell my mac don't default to the two displays being mirrored please never mirror <laughs> By default, if I want a mirrored, great, I'll tell you that. But but my experience is with current Mac OS that it defaults to mirroring every time I plug in a new projector and there's no way to change that default. But I would I would love that. So I don't know. Uncle P in the chat room says you could carry an Apple TV with you and airplay the display as a backup to your backup. I like that idea, too. That's, you know. If you again, if you're doing this as for your you know part or all of your livelihood, that that's that's easy money to spend just to have something right there. So I like it. I like it. Brad asks, uh, my son dropped his iPhone SE running 13.3 and it is toast. The screen is broken, can't access anything. But thankfully, I had a backup on our Mac Mini running 10.15.2 and his old f iPhone 5S in the drawer for just such an emergency. So here's the problem. The 5S cannot run iOS 13. It can only run iOS 12. And the Mac won't let me restore a 13.3 backup to a 12.4.5 iPhone. 
I found an article that instructed me to edit the product version in the plist file of the backup, but now that backup does not show up in the manage backups list and is not even available to restore from. Am I out of luck? If so, I am shaking my fist with one finger extended at Apple. <laughs> uh, I like that. I, there, I think there's an emoji for that. In fact, Brad, um, we need now we need the fist shake, the, the closed fist shake emoji, not just the closed fist emoji, but the closed fist shake emoji. Um, honestly, you know, my again, fall, falling into the what would I do if I were there? I would try amazing. I would see what it could do. You know, Amazing does some pretty special things with backups and will allow you to manipulate the data in a backup such that you can choose to restore only certain things. So I wonder if there's something about Amazing that would make this work. Um, I, I actually reached out to the folks at Amazing, but I haven't heard back from them. So I, I don't have this answer here, but uh, but that that would be certainly the next thing that I would try is is that and i'm trying to think if there's any other any other work around i don't know that there is well what if this might be difficult to get done but would icloud restore the data would an you know if you restored the backup from icloud instead of from your mac and i realize you might not have the backup in icloud i but but just kind of as a mental exercise would that be intelligent enough to know, ah, I've got to adapt this thing through some, you know, Apple magic that could do it. I, I don't know the answer, obviously, but, uh, hmm. but you, you know, I, I, uh, I don't know. That, that you mean like doing a uh, restore, a restore from iCloud. Like he's doing the restore from, okay. his, from his Mac, but doing a restore from iCloud would, <sighs> would there be some, some smarts there that, that might, right. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brian Monroe in the chat room says, uh, nice idea, but no, I've tried it. And iCloud also has the same limitations for iOS devices. So, okay. Well that, you know, this is how we do things, right? We exhaust our, we, we troubleshoot and exhaust options. Uh, so I would, I, I amazing is where I would begin with this because it, it does, they really have, have worked uh, and, and they convert your backups to their own format. So it's possible this might be able to to do something that uh, th honestly that's my only hope so um yeah yeah you get your data back you wouldn't get your settings but but i mean maybe that's all you need so and it's also possible remember that a lot of apps save their settings in a way to iCloud as well so and and save their data even to iCloud as well so you might find that you've you've got more of that data accessible to you than than it seems right now maybe not but depending on what apps you're using and how you're using them and all of that stuff you may find that you know starting from a nuke and pave which is essentially what we're talking about here uh if you use the analog on the mac although that's just a metaphor anyway thankfully um that might it, you might be OK. I mean, certainly, you know, nuking and paving your Mac and and getting back up to functional is a much simpler and faster process now than it was even five years ago and certainly even 10 years ago. So the same you may find, depending again, depending on your use case, you may find the same to be true with your iPhone. So there you go. That's those is my thoughts. What do you think, Mr. Braun? Any other thoughts on this one? <laughs> No, that's no, you pretty much covered it. I amazing is our only hope. I, I hope. I hope. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's go to the Mac on this one. Rob says a question regarding the shares that I have on my Synology, but this would apply to really any network shares, whether they're coming from another Mac or, uh, you know, a, a third party network storage device or something. He says, uh, I can't seem to maintain connection to my shares on my disk station without a considerable, considerable degree of consternation. Sometimes the NAS appears in the finder by host name. Sometimes it appears by IP address. Sometimes I get an error message when I try to click on a share. I can only surmise this is due to the Samba implementation in Mac OS, plus some quirkiness with the finder, at least as far as I'm concerned. 
So my question to you guys is this. How do you manage these connections efficiently? I really like a clean desktop, so I don't want to go and make a bunch of alias shortcuts to each share, etc. Is there some utility or finder replacement that handles this more elegantly? I know it's a simple question, but I really don't know the answers. So what does your approach to this look like? Okay, you're right, uh, Rob, that this is a simple question. I have not yet found a simple answer, although it, it would seem relatively simple for someone to write a utility to do the things that I have mine doing. What I do is the first thing I do is put an alias to each of my shares that I want to remain and have mounted in login items so that they're at least theoretically mounted at login or startup. Then I created an automator action that I saved as a self-running application. Okay, so you can you can build automator actions that, that, that they're saved as apps that you just double click and they run standalone, which mounts those shares. It, it actually is a little more in depth than that. What it does is it ejects the shares first and then mounts them. And I know this seems crazy, but otherwise you might wind up with several mounts to the same share. So I have it eject and then mount. And but I don't ever just run that willy nilly. I have a keyboard maestro script that runs that app either when I log in. So to make sure that these things launch or when it notices that one of them is unmounted. And uh, and that's kind of the trick is is, you know, waking from sleep. It looks for it. If it's unmounted, then it runs the, the, the you know, the application that I that I wrote. So. Um, in, in automator. So very, very straightforward. So I'm using keyboard maestro as sort of the trigger to say, is, is this volume mounted? If it is, don't do anything. If it is, if it isn't go and run this little app to make sure that it is. And that tends to keep things mounted most of the time, but it is not a perfect solution. I, I really I, like, I think many of us, I wish that there was some way of telling the finder, just keep this share mounted, please. For the love of all that is good and pure, I, like, could there be a checkbox that says that? For the love of all that is good and pure, please try to keep this mounted. I, I would like that, but we don't have that, John. So, um, what do you deal with this, John, do you, or, or do you just kind of deal with it? Have you have you cre have you created a solution for it, or do you deal with it? I pretty much no. I don't, I usually. Don't mount servers unless, you know, on a per instance basis, when I need to get something on, I was on a server, then I mount it. So okay. I, I typically don't leave uh, network volumes mounted when I'm not using them. Interesting. Okay. So, okay. I mean, and that that's just a use case scenario. I mean, for me, I use stuff on network vol volumes all the time. I have Hazel scripts that um that auto copy you know and archive things off to network volume so i'm not worried about uh you know filling up disk space like like our podcast files right i keep them on this computer for two weeks and anything in that folder that matches you know certain criteria this is what i use hazel for you know shoots those off to uh my disk station for you know cold storage essentially well it's warm storage it's right there online but not on this computer and that keeps this computer from filling up because i was doing you know this is the thing about automation you know you do things in the moment it's like oh it's pretty quick to just go and archive these when the disk gets full and finally i was talking with somebody and it's like oh, i could write i could easily write a hazel action for that and literally never think about it again and and so I, that's what i did and that's the beauty of automation uh so i highly recommend hazel for that kind of stuff but to keep your volumes mounted uh, someone in the chat room, Ari too, uh, or I guess Ari and probably his second account of the day or something uses an app or suggests an app called auto mounter from Pixelize in New Zealand. And, uh, we've got a link in the show notes for you. It mm, sure seems I'm just scrolling through it now, but it sure seems to do exactly what, uh, I wished for. And it is available on the Mac app store and, uh, it is, it's not cheap in that it's 17 bucks, but oh no. Uh, oh, I don't know why it shows 17. It's 17 New Zealand dollars. Good news. 10 us dollars. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Tired of remounting your network shares. Auto mounter ensures that your shares are always mounted when you need them. So I may be spending 10 bucks on this. Uh, 
because that way I don't have to deal with maintaining my, my automator keyboard maestro, you know, scenario. So very cool. Thanks Ari. Much appreciated. That's good. Good, good. Um, you know, John, this is the perfect time to talk about our first sponsor, which is Zapier at zapier.com slash MGG. That's Z A P I E R.com slash MGG. We're talking about automation. We're talking about doing all those things that make your life easier. Yes. You, you can do these repetitive tasks on your own and they seem relatively easy when the, you do them. But when you add up the time that it takes to do it and the mental effort thought, you know, in, in the process of remembering to do it. Well, sometimes a lot of times an automated solution works better for, I'll use a perfect example here at Mac Geek Cab, We have our premium, uh, you know, uh, program, right? Where folks like you uh, donate and, and you can do that on a recurring basis or a one-time basis. And, and we like to thank you in the show. And so, uh, what happens, though, is we get a bunch of emails in telling us when your orders have been processed. And then what I would do is I would copy, I would read each of those emails and copy your name uh, and your city to a spreadsheet that I could go through and then thank you during the show. And that's a relatively tedious process. I was happy to do it because here we are, you know, thanking the folks that are supporting us. It's great. But then I realized, and I've been using Zapier for years, right? Then the best part about Zapier is once you get something working, you kind of forget about Zapier. <laughs> well, I had forgotten about Zapier. And then I was reminded of it uh, at a conference. And I had it running, doing lots of other things. But when it just does stuff, you forget that it's there. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. So what I did is I linked, Z I used Zapier. It's like the glue that ties all these different engines together. I use Zapier to look at our e-commerce engine. We use one with WordPress called WooCommerce and Zapier links with that like it does with, I think, like thousands of others. And then I linked it with Google Sheets and I said, OK, anytime a new order comes in, go fish this particular information, i.e. your name and your city out of that and put it over in this spreadsheet. And now it just happens automatically. <laughs> I don't have to do any of the work. It's all right there. It makes life so easy. And I have Zapier doing all sorts of other things, linking with like Slack. And, you know, like I said, it links with Google Docs so I can get a Slack notification when someone edits a Google Doc. And I mean, it's just all that kind of stuff. And you can try it out for 14 days for free as a trial. Go to Zapier.com slash MGG for your free 14 day trial. Right. And this is. Only good through the end of the month. So you have to make sure you do this right now. And why wouldn't you? Because this is the kind of thing that we love here on Mac Geek Cap. I mean, we were just talking about automation. And now here we are with a sponsor that's going to help us do this. And it can help you with all kinds of different stuff. So go check it out. Go to Zapier.com slash MGG for your 14-day trial. Uh, again, that's Zapier.com slash MGG. And then tell us what you're doing with Zapier. And we'll share that here on the show, too. So... Our thanks to Zapier, uh, again, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash M-G-G for your 14-day trial. Our thanks to them for that. All right. Um, next question here, John. Rand has, um, well, you know, a question because that's kind of how it works here on the show. Rand asks, he says, uh, I run a 2012 MacBook Pro Retina with Mavericks. And I think he means Mavericks, but when, there's always sometimes he might mean Mojave, but I don't think so. To support some legacy expensive apps. If I clone the Mavericks OS to an external SSD and then update the machine's OS on the internal, can I continue to run the Mavericks OS by booting uh, into it from the quote unquote now Catalina machine? Uh, and is the answer the same, even if I were to do so using a newer laptop, like a 15 inch MacBook Pro that I've been drooling for? So the answer is yes. If your machine can run whatever OS you want to run, then you could boot to it on an external drive. No problem. And uh, and run it. You know, it wouldn't also be running Catalina. Catalina would be on, be on the insert, internal drive. But at that moment in time, you'd be running from booted from the external drive and therefore running whatever it is, Mavericks, Mojave, whatever you want it to be. Um, the question about a newer machine. 
is whether or not that machine is capable of running the OS or perhaps a better way to think about it, whether or not that OS is capable of booting the machine that you're asking about. Because, for example, I don't even think Mojave can boot the new 16 inch MacBook Pro. I might be wrong about that. It's possible they built it so that Mojave can boot that machine. But generally speaking, OSs that were released prior to the machine being released cannot boot the newer machines. So that's the only thing to think about. Uh, the other way to get around it would be, you know, to virtualize that old OS and then you can run it, uh, you know, inside of whatever parallels or VMware or whatever they, that process is not the simplest process in the world. Really the, the, it should be simpler and they quite frankly know it could be simpler, but they just haven't spent the engineering resources. Like when I talked to the folks at parallels and VMware, one way to do it is to install a clean OS and then migration assistant into that clean OS on, on like parallels or VMware and then you're good to go. So any thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Mac tracker can give you some guidance as far as the OS is that a machine can handle. Nice. I like it. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. No, I, that's, that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. Do, does oh, Mac tracker probably doesn't have an entry for the 16 inch MacBook pro. We, we found that last week when we were trying to find the, um, the, what you yeah. Uh, so not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you know, there you go. It's good. All right. Shall we continue with our, uh, our questions here, John? Sure. So, I, you know, normally we only talk about the day that the show is released, uh, which is Monday, February 3rd, if all goes according to plan. But oftentimes, uh, as those of you that join us in the chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream know, we record the day before. So on Sunday. And this episode, in fact, is being recorded on Sunday, February 2nd. And normally we don't obsess about the date that it's being recorded, but... This is quite the date about which to obsess uh, because this is the first time in 909 years. We're all obsessed with palindromes here, right? Well, at least I am. And, and you know, I know some of you are, too. And so 909 in and of itself, not only being part of the title of a great Beatles song is, of course, a palindrome, being that it reads the same forward and backwards. Uh, but the day that we're recording this episode is February 2nd. 2020, which means that if you do uh, either month, day, four digit year or day, month, four digit year, uh, it is a palindrome, right? O two o two two o two o, right? So there you go. Or if you do year, month, day, uh, four digit year, two digit month, two digit day, you get two o two o o two o two. So that's the that happens once about every thousand years. Um, so which is cool. So. Uh, we like numbers here is what I'm trying to say. And, and I wanted to celebrate this, this very, very palindromic event. Uh, and Brian has a question about numbers. Uh, he said, <clears throat> very simply, please explain the difference between megabits and megabytes. So it, the simple answer is that one megabyte equals eight megabits or more generically, Bytes are quite a bit larger than bits. But John, of course, because he's John F. Braun, knows a little bit more about this that I think you would like to share, right? Well, and Apple and others have, uh, have shared this. So, eight bits and a byte. Okay. That's how things started. Uh, the only thing that a lot of us observe during hard drives and stuff getting bigger because you can measure the content of a hard drive in megabytes as well, or terabytes or, you know, whatever they, they get up to. But um, there started to be a deviation because the hard drive industry would define um, a megabyte in terms of a thousand and not uh, base 10 instead of base two. So, Two to the eighth is 1024, right? And a thousand is a thousand. So the difference between those two isn't that great. But as well, you start well, at scale, it might be though, right? Yeah. 
Well, that that's when there was this, you know, hubbub in the industry a while back. People were like, well, you're ripping me off. You said I get this many megabytes and I'm really not because you're measuring it differently. And so eventually, and I think the, you know, I was looking on one of Apple's pages. They used to have a big explanation saying, okay, well, here's how we define a megabyte. Okay. Mm. Deal with it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. I mean, sort of. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah, no more. Oh, okay. We're oh, I wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, so we're we're good on we're good on megabytes versus megabits. Is that right? I think we are. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, Gillies writes. Uh, so I updated my old iPad Air two to thirteen point three. My problem is that I can't connect it to my twenty seventeen five K iMac that runs Catalina uh, since I updated to 13.1 and then 13.2 and 13.3. I felt that my iPad was much slower to launch apps. Batteries seem to be depleted much faster with mail and even worse Safari open. Uh, and he says, you know, to improve that or in the hopes of improving that I tried resetting the iPad from scratch over the holidays. The device had gone through many iOS updates over more than, you know, it's four years. So I did it uh, to connect to my I, I did connect it to my iMac after that reset and I saw it in the finder and made a backup. I do not use much iCloud for iPhoto, just screenshots of the iPad and such. I don't have an iPhone. I don't have an Apple Music subscription. I manage my music library local with my iMac and my Synology network storage. I did recently notice that I don't have any music in my iPad and indeed nothing in stockage not sure what stockage means that's a that's a word that uh is probably colloquial native to wherever gillies is from anyway uh i don't remember if the music was there when i saw the ipad connected to catalina i've got quite a few folders of documents locally on the ipad uh etc i tried to connect the ipad to the imac i see the ipad now for about one second and then it disappears from the finder I rebooted, of course, both the Mac and the iPad still plugged in. Then I see the iPad, but the finder gives me only two options, restore as a new device or restore from backup. So I tried the latter. The backup was from December when I did my most recent backup. After the restore, my data is there, except podcasts that re-download in Overcast. The iPad is seen by Catalina only if I reboot it, and then I only have the same two options. Before trying reset as new device, I thought I would ask for your advice. Would you try this option while the iPad is connected to the iMac? And would you try first to disconnect the iPad like I did in December, reset it to factory, and then reconnect? So this is obviously another weird one, which is why it makes it to the show. Um, but we've had a couple of other notes, not a lot, but a few, about Catalina's Finder not managing iOS devices quite right. So again, you know, following the, this is weird. What would I do if I were there? Because I don't immediately know the answer. Have you tried something like iMazing to see what it sees, right? And you can get a 14 day free trial. In fact, I actually, I think, and there's a deal because they were sponsors of CES. I think if you go to iMazing.com slash uh, TDO, well, that'll work. I don't think that's the thing they used for CES. Um, but but I think it'll work. That'll get you a 30 percent off after your um, after your 14 day free trial. So uh, but but try the trial out and see what it sees. It might truly be it, it. So it's either something with the finder and its new software functionality that lets it manage iPads or it's something with your, you know, something deeper down on your Mac, like at the USB subsystem or something that's causing the iPad not to be seen you checking it with iMazing will tell you which way it's going right whether it's the finder is just being wonky about it but iMazing has no trouble holding a connection or iMazing can't even hold a connection and so you've got something deeper and if it's something deeper now that i'm sort of walking through this i would think about uh how you're connecting it like wh what usb port you're connecting it to if it if that's part of a USB hub 
or that's the a direct on your iMac. If it's one, I would try it with the other. There might be a power issue or like, I don't know. Right. There's there's lots of different reasons why a USB device might, uh, uh, you know, present oddly uh, or not present. So, uh, yeah. What do you think, Mr. Braun? Or don't. Yeah, I think you suggest that I'm with you is that you could connect it via USB or, you know, try connecting it another way and see if you get different results. I yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Try. Right. When the same thing, when doing the same thing doesn't yield different results, try something different. Yeah. No, I like that. That's that's good troubleshooting advice. Yeah. And it, it uh, yeah. So that that's where I would go with it. I don't know that I would I, I wouldn't jump to wiping it clean again. I mean, certainly something could have gone wrong with that process, but it doesn't sound, it sounds like it's different than that. You were having this problem before you wiped it clean or, or weren't you? Maybe you weren't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, just try, try different stuff. Try a different cable, yeah, try different ports, see, see if something acts differently and, even if it doesn't solve the problem, if you see something different, that might be the kind of thing that that, you know, triggers an idea like, oh, hey, wait a minute. I'm seeing this is different when I do that. OK, this tells me that it's, you know, more likely to be a problem with software or hardware or, you know, something like that. Try the iPad on a different Mac uh, and see if it just appears. You don't need to change anything with it, but that'll help troubleshoot you know, where the problem is. You can try the same cable, try different cables, all that stuff. So that's where I'd go with it. And hopefully it gets you somewhere. That's the, that's the idea. That's the idea. No more thoughts on that one, John. No. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So John, I, I, I want to talk about our second sponsor here, which is PDF pen 11 from smile and you know pdf pen is one of those tools that i don't use it every day but i use it several times a week and if i didn't have it i'm, I'm really not sure what i would do because it's the ultimate tool for editing pdfs on my mac uh it, it, you know i can easily like it, it, it i can go so much deeper with this than i ever imagined i'd be able to do like to the point where you can edit the content of table cells inside a PDF. You can like edit the text. You can change fonts. You can move graphics around. I mean, PDFs are these things that are fairly static, you, you know, or at least they seem to be. That's not the case, you know, and PDF pen really lets you dig, dig deep. And, and then on the other side, you can turn things into PDFs that also aren't necessarily the easiest thing. I mean, you can turn web pages into PDFs and, and control how the layout works and all of that stuff, which is really, really handy when you need to share these things in a meaningful way. You can even export PDFs to word and Excel. I, you know, it just like, there's so many different things you can do with this. And then of course, the thing that I often use it for is signing documents uh, not only can I keep my signature in there, but I can also they, they have these um, dynamic, they call them stamps, where you drag in a thing and it shows like I mine, you know, I have it set up so that when I drag this thing in, it says, you know, I put my signature in there and I drag this dynamic stamp in that says approved by Dave Hamilton and puts the date and the time. So it makes it look really nice for the person that's reading it. It doesn't just look like, you know, a, a signature with a type date. It looks like a signature with an electronically stamped, you know, time and date. And that really does make it more uh, official in, in that sense and kind of gives people a little more confidence, makes it seem more professional. And and that's really the trick, right, is you want any of your communication like this to look professional. And PDF Pen 11 makes that super, super easy. And of course, it supports, you know, Mac OS Catalina, obviously, and then there's PDF pen for iPad and iPhone that is totally iOS 13 ready. So you got to go check this out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast and go get it. 
And 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 now now you can now you can make your stuff look professional and get those edits just right without having to go back to the source document or anything like that. So check it out. And our thanks to Smile and PDF Pen 11 for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. You got some new toys this week or aimed. Well, no, sorry. I think you got several new toys this week. What um, what'd you get? Well, I got a couple of new toys. So, <clears throat> so here's the first thing I ordered um, in preparation for the second toy. So, you know, we were talking about uh, USB-C adapters, and I ordered the uh, Anchor one that you suggested. Okay. You know, it was like 40 bucks or something. Yep. So it's USB-C. It has three USB 3A ports, HDMI and Ethernet. Why? And I also got some drive enclosures. Oh, nice. Because I was going to be moving some data around. Well, what was, what was I going to be moving some data around to? Well, I just decided to get a shiny new MacBook Pro 16 inch. Oh, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, so it was fun ordering it. Um, I ordered it on my you know old machine and it um, connected to my phone to do Apple Pay, which uh, hmm. is kind of cool. Um, I put here's, it on my Apple here's card. Here's the thing. You don't have to connect to your phone to do Apple Pay anymore because your new machine has a T2 chip in it. And so yes, it does. you get to you, the next time you just do it right there locally on the device. Yeah. Yeah. So it was neat that, um, you know, I was able to, pay it, you know, when, when I went to purchase it, it's like, OK, we'll select your card and, you know, do touch ID on your phone so you can pay for it. Put it on the Apple card. So I get three percent cash back, which is uh, nice. And it arrived in two days and I got pretty much the run of the mill. I don't know, I guess higher end. Uh, it was like twenty nine ninety nine or something. Which three um, K, which which um, what, what what processor, what RAM, what hard drive? I guess is the, is the, uh, the way so I got the uh, two point three gigahertz eight core Intel Core i nine. OK, which should yeah. be plenty of processors. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, 16 gigs of RAM and one terabyte. Nice. Um, SSD, which is what my old machine had. So, uh, yeah, no, I think I think that's a I mean, <laughs> look, that's way more CPU than you will probably need and is exactly the right thing to get. I think that's great, man. Yeah. Yep. So I did the migration and it didn't quite work out as planned. So at first I was like, you know, I maybe I'll just plug uh, a backup uh, or a drive sure. into the uh into the adapter using USB and, you know, get some throughput there. But then I was like, wow, you know what I could do though? Um, and so I actually ordered something again and went to my local Apple store, which Trumbull is the closest one to me. And I actually ordered, um, so Apple makes a, uh, Thunderbolt three to Thunderbolt two adapter. Yep. Yeah. And I was yeah, yeah. thinking maybe I could use target disc mode to, uh, transfer the data because that would be faster because then that would be, uh, you know, USB three in theory is uh, five uh, gigabits, right? And Thunderbolt two, or no, no, my uh, the MacBook Pro, my old MacBook Pro had Thunderbolt one, so that's ten gigabits, but it's still faster. Correct. Yeah, in theory, for some reason, it didn't work. It didn't see. Uh, I put my old MacBook Pro into target disk mode, and it shows you know FireWire and Thunderbolt icons because those are the two interfaces that it supports. And it just didn't see it. I, I don't know what it was because I put, I those, put those the Thunderbolt machine. three to Thunderbolt two adapters are I, uh, like the best thing I can. The best way I can describe them is wonky. I, I use them truly as a last resort. I, I would I would spend money to avoid using one of those uh, just because they've proven to be super flaky. So, I mean, they work. In, in that if you well, need to connect like a drive or something and all you've got is the in, interface, you know, the enclosure that, that uses that fine. But I would not rely on those long term. In fact, I tried to here in the studio this summer when I moved the 2014 iMac up here. And it, it was like that was part of that disaster. But the unreliability of this machine all hinged on one of those adapters. And we've heard the same from listeners. So it's good to have one. Like if you've got, you know, if you're like we are and you have those older devices or whatever it is that, you know, you might stumble upon someday. And you're like, oh, crap, I don't have a Thunderbolt. The two oh, yes, I do. You know, OK, great. 
Uh, that's good, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't definitely not have it as part of my workflow. If, if at all possible to yeah. avoid. Yeah. But I, I have had the old Mac in target this mode before. So oh. yeah, so it could be the adapter. Yeah. The thing is when I hooked it up to my Mac mini, which has Thunderbolt two, it could see that machine. So I don't know if there's something flaky with the port. Oh no, you um, hit, you hit the, you hit the nail on the head. It's a oh, Thunderbolt right. three to Thunderbolt two adapter, not a Thunderbolt three to Thunderbolt one adapter. Well, shouldn't Make, it? I would. Yeah, I don't I, know. I mean, yeah. I, yes. I thought it'd be backwards compatible. Maybe it's not. Maybe I it's. Know. I don't know. It's it's barely directly compatible is, is what we found, at least not in a reliable sense. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the adapter plugged into the port on the Mac, but yeah, whatever. So anyway, so I'm like, OK, well, what's my next option? And my next option was to uh, suck the data off of a, a backup. Sure. Right. So I plugged right. it in and. You know, it gave it, it was funny, you know, time estimating is always weird. So when it started off, I, I think I had about 600 gigs of data on the drive. It's like, yeah, this will take about five hours. I'm like, really? That seems. And it was giving me throughputs of like 200 megabytes a second or so, which I think is the speed of the SSD that sure. I had the backup on. And then I look back on the screen and it's like, oh, yeah, 27 minutes. <laughs> so did, like, did you not? It would Wi-Fi have been that much slower? I mean, especially when you factor in all the headaches of, of all of that, because like I've done all of my migrations recently, including all the ones that I was doing this summer back and forth between the, you know, the MacBook Pro, the 13 inch that I was testing from Apple and the MacBook Air. And they, you know, they create their own ad hoc connection. It doesn't like they use your your infrastructure of your Wi-Fi to find each other. And then once they find each other, it drops down to huh. that ad hoc connection. And it's, it's, it's the fastest, most reliable thing that I've used in a oh, long okay. time for direct things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. My only consideration is that the old MacBook was 802.n, not AC. Oh, oh, that. So okay. it'd be, yeah, no, no, no. So it'd be a little slower. So anyways, slower. so the migration went, went fine. Good. Um, well, actually, no, it didn't. I ran into something. I think you would run into this. So I plugged the drive in and it's like, um, yeah, by the way, the version of the OS on this drive is newer than the OS on the machine. So you want to update? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And it's like, OK, looking for the update. Can't find it. I'm like, oh, you oh yeah. Me? Welcome to the club, man. You're right. Yeah, that sucked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think you went through that, too. And I think the solution was I did a reinstall of Catalina and then it bump the version up on that machine or at least that's how i solved it yeah okay so okay i'm glad that that worked for you you know the weird thing is uh, like with that t2 chip in there you can get yourself into a corner where that's a very difficult thing to do like i got my machine to the point uh, i i did that right and then wanted to just you know install a new os before i sent it into apple i think just to get the keyboard fixed and uh and I never was able to get it. And when Apple got it, they're like, oh, yeah, the motherboard's toast or whatever, because the T2 chip had gotten out of sync with the motherboard. It's not it's not quite perfect yet. So have you gone in to uh, uh, what re recovery mode and launched the security utility to tell your Mac that it's allowed to boot from an external drive? Because by default, um, it is not. And you right, right. might want to change um, that before before you cannot. Yeah, because I, I remember going into the utility and I tried to do something and it's like, uh, what's your admin password? It's like, uh, I haven't set it yet. <laughs> oh, that another kind of that's weird. Oh, yeah. You know, you have to have an OS already on the drive with an admin password before you can do that mm -hmm, in recovery mm -hmm. mode. Yeah. So don't forget to go back and do that. Well, I mean, choose your own path. You know, Apple has chosen for all of us that we should not let our machines boot from external drives. I think that's. I think that's a pretty dangerous thing to do with I, what I really think they should do is upon setup of the machine, a dialogue should come up and say, hey, with this computer by default, it, because this is new behavior with these T2 Max, right? This computer cannot boot from an external drive. If you want to keep that behavior, click OK. If you want to change that behavior, you know, choose from a drop down, tell us what you want and then go. I, you know, I, I like that they give us the utility to change it, but I, I feel like they could be a little more upfront about that because we've had folks right in that have been caught, you know, by the fact that they assumed like all Macs they'd owned prior when they ran into trouble, they could boot from an external drive and you can't with these new ones unless you change it. So, 
Well, this is great, man. So you're in, not only do you have a new shiny fast machine, but, but you've joined dongle world. So welcome, welcome to the uh, dongle world side. This is good. Yeah. So some of the things about this thing. So one, oh my gosh, it's so thin and light compared to the, uh, <laughs> the uh, 2012 machine. Yeah. It's amazing. They could cram all this in here. The, uh, I like the touch bar. The touch bar is, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, shows different things, context sensitive. And then have yeah, you edited the out, touch bar yet where you can no, like drag I, things down to it? It, 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 you, Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's definitely worth like, you can put a screenshot tool on the touch bar, but what's the, the cool part is you can act like when you're editing it, you're dragging from your screen, like down to the touch bar. It's pretty cool. So I, I definitely recommend playing with that. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing is, so, you know, of course I logged it into, uh, uh, iCloud and it's like, hey, you want to you want to do Apple Pay on this machine? I'm like, oh, OK. Right. Right. Yeah. So all my cards and it actually asked for the, uh, you know, CCV or whatever for, for each of the cards before it added it. And then the other thing that's nice on this is this also has touch ID because I love touch ID. <laughs> so it's kind of neat to be able to use that for um, uh, logging in. So you can use it in lieu of uh, typing your, your password. Right. So, uh, oh, it's the best. Does um, I, I do it with, I mean, I do it with everything on my laptop now and I love it. Uh, does last pass support it? One password supports touch ID on the Mac. Oh, does last pass look. Yeah. Uh, you might, you might out. need to switch <laughs> because uh, maybe it does. I don't know, but, um, but yeah. And then, uh, uh, Cirrus Ghost in the chat room says, try better touch tool. Uh, I think in, in, this is in regards to your comments about the touch bar that you have uh, kind of a new way of editing that touch bar. So, uh, so there you go. Yeah. I will put that. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks, Cirrus Ghost. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. like it. So, um, you are well, sending you, a box. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm yeah. So I chose, so when you buy a new machine, uh, they give you the option. They're like, Hey, you got an old one. You want to trade in? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a few hundred bucks for it. That's great. So they're sending a box so I can, uh, dispose awesome. of that responsibly. Yeah. Somebody pointed out one person in my feed was like, well, you know, you could probably get about 500 bucks for it. If you, if you put it on the open market and I'm like, nah, I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Deal yeah. With that. No, they, right. Well, and that you're, you're trading convenience for dollars there. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's how it works. That's great. So it, it's yeah. good. It's good that you like your new MacBook pro John, but there's somebody that doesn't uh, not yours specifically, really? but in, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and it's somebody that all of us know about it or most of us anyway. And that's Neil Young. And you know, Neil Young, this is not so recently to, to give this some context. Neil Young was on uh, the Verge cast with Neil Patel and they were talking about music and technology. And Neil Young got into this rant about how the MacBook Pro, uh, the new, the 16 inch specifically, but I think he's sort of just talking in general uh, is crap. And it's like, you know, in terms of recording on it, he's like, it's crap. It's Fisher price. You know, he was really, really downplaying it. This is not the first time that Mr. Young uh, has dipped his toes into our geeky technological waters. Right. Uh, a few years ago, he and famed producer, the guy I mean, he did L.A. Woman and other things. This guy, Bruce Botnick, uh, partnered up and created that Pono player uh, that looked like a Toblerone. Right. But it was a, a portable player that played everything at the. And, and this is the phrase that they kept throwing around at the bit rate that the artist intended. So it would play up to uh, 24, you know, bit 96 K songs. And they were saying how MP3s are terrible. Well, you know, and, and Neil Young is still beating down this door. And so a lot of smart people have said a lot of smart things online about this, but as I've been digging into this, I, you know, it, it, it's like, why? And so I tried to approach this like I do a lot of things with with compassion, right? Like, why? Where is all this coming from, Mr. Young? Now, I have to say, I've never been a Neil Young fan. I, I totally appreciate his place in rock and roll. Like, And there are many people that I love to listen to and uh, that were, 
you know, super influenced by this guy. Like it, rock and roll, he did, he, you know, he had his his influence and has certainly left his mark on rock and roll aside from these sort of, you know, technological gibberish that he keeps trying to throw out. Uh, I've just never liked to hear him sing. So I, there are some Neil Young songs that I like. I just don't want to hear him sing them. Uh, I just don't care for his voice. And that's fine. That, and that's coming from a, a lifelong Rush fan. So I get it when people say they don't like to hear a singer, right? Because I have I love Getty Lee's voice, but that's just how that goes. But, you know, Neil Young is it, like, I, it, as I as I approach this, I think that there's, you know, relevance involved in in him saying this and a little bit of nostalgia and he's got this idea of purity right and and and, he, and this is what he's holding on to but the reality is like he is holding technology hostage in time because when he recorded all of his hits that he then, you know, delivered to his fans that created the career and life that that I'm assuming he enjoys. Uh, and, you know, now he's even an American, right? Um, he or an American citizen. He. Um, I'm sure he, the engineer just picked whatever the engineer felt was the best technology available at the time, especially on those first records that Neil was doing. Right. And so. He was using state of the art tech. And now the state, he has not evolved, you, you know, he's stuck in, in that world. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I get this, you know, as a human who is lucky enough to still be actively aging, I can relate a little bit to the concept of relevance, right. And purity and all of that. And there's two ways to approach this, right. You can wax poetic about all the things you did way back when, or you can embrace change and evolve with the times. And Neil has not really, you know, he tries to live in both camps, but this whole thing that he, that he started with Pono and maybe it's just cause he's entrenched on this. I don't know, but this whole thing, you know, about how humans like CD quality sucks and you need to, cause CDs are 16 bit at 44 kilohertz. And, uh, and you know, his Pono player is 24 bit at 96 kilohertz. Well, the reality is humans can't hear the difference in that. He talks about how you need to like, set up an analog recording of something and then the digital version. And he's like, you can hear the difference. I don't know that you can. Um, in fact, no one reliably can. Uh, it, there have been blind AB tests. We call them ABX tests because they're, they're, they're blind to both the, the person administering the test and the person receiving the test. And when you take all of that knowledge out of it and you don't know what you're listening to, uh, the, people generally uh, cannot tell the difference now telling the difference between like CD quality and let's say Apple's AAC 256 K quality. It, most of the time you also can't hear a difference there. I have trained myself to hear the difference on very select tracks. One is Kathy's waltz from Dave Brubeck's timeout album. Okay. I can hear the difference between CD and Apple's AA256 on on like very select segments of that song because I compared them a lot and I went nuts and I went deep because I knew that album was really well recorded with just ribbon mics in this church. Right. I'm pretty sure it was in a church. Uh, and and there's some breath to that. Like the length of the decay is where you can hear the compression artifact kick in. Now, does it change my enjoyment? No. But I can if I really am like listening for it, I can hear it there. I can't hear it on every track. I can't hear it universally, but I can. But the difference between 16, you know, 44 on a CD and 2496 on a, uh, you know, on Neil's Pono player. No, it, it the, the humans can't hear the difference in that. Now, if you know that you're hearing your preferred vinyl version versus the, you know, high quality digital version of it. Then you can tell the difference and your brain will actually be if you have previously decided that you like vinyl better than CD and you know that you're listening on vinyl instead of CD or comparing the two. If you know what you're doing, then your brain will tell you that you like the thing that you like better and you will actually like fire pleasure receptors on the one that you like better. This is called confirmation bias and it's a very real thing. And that's why when somebody says, oh, you got to hear this on my speakers, it sounds so much better. It's like, you know what? That's great. And and 
I, I love that you like the sound of the things on the things that you bought. Like, of course, that's awesome. And I'm not going to, I'm not here to ruin that for you. Like we all suffer from, I don't want to say, we all experience confirmation bias. Neil seems to think that he can push his confirmation bias onto the world as though it is fact when, it, when in fact it's not. Um, and so it's a shame when you've got somebody out there that certainly is a respected artist constantly saying things like this uh, because you can record stuff on a MacBook Pro. I mean, look at what Billie Eilish did, right? She's got like, I mean, she won all the Grammys and recorded everything with a MacBook Pro and the podcasting mic. It was an audio tech or a USB mic. It's an Audio Technica 2020 that she used. Same mic that Adam Christensen uses for MacCast. Um, it's a good mic. It's a condenser mic. So I, I wouldn't use it for personally. I wouldn't use it for podcasting because it'll pick up a lot of the extra stuff in the room. But for a sung vocal mic, it's great. Adam deals with it because he like padded the heck out of his podcast room. So he's, he's fine. But, you know, like basically the same setup that Adam uses to do. Uh, his thing and not all that far off from the setup that you and I would use in a hotel room to record a podcast. She recorded, you know, albums that won her all the Grammys. So uh, maybe we were doing the wrong thing when we were in Vegas, John, maybe we should have been recording an album um, and telling people that we were, you know, uh, young women, but that, that would be, that's weird. So maybe we shouldn't have done that. Maybe, maybe we made the right choice. So yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I don't know what to do about Neil. I, I wish we wouldn't give him this platform, quite frankly. Uh, and that's sort of why I held back on writing or saying something about this. It was like, we just don't need to. But it got spread around. So many people were asking me about it. It's like, okay, let's address this. But to quote another n Native American songwriter, not Native American, but but born in America songwriter, you know, um, and I'll paraphrase. I hope Neil Young will remember. No, he won't. This geeky man don't need him around anyhow, but I don't mean that in a morbid way. I hope he continues to live a long and prosperous life, but just stops poo pooing tech that he doesn't really understand. So focus yeah. on the positive brother, Neil, that has served him quite well in the past. So there you go. You know, there we are. Can we talk about cool stuff found now, John? Indeed. Sweet. Thanks. I, did you? I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have anything to, to say about Mister Mister Young and any of that there? No, you okay. uh, you you covered it well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thanks for giving. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks thanks for your time, folks. All right, now let's tell you about some cool stuff. Uh, Andrew sends us this man. Like this is one of the coolest things. It's called Mouseless, and. Uh, it's in set app, although you can get it, you know, on your own too. this is an app for people that enjoy using keyboard shortcuts in that it trains you to use new keyboard shortcuts. And the way it does this is it puts you through like a series, it gamifies it a little bit, but it's not just keyboard shortcuts for Mac OS. They have all kinds of third party apps in there. So I, I did some, you know, tutorials slash games about slack because i use slack all the time and it was like you know it just shows you a keyboard shortcut it shows you what it does and then the keys to press and then you press them and it shows you three or four and you press the keys to match and then it moves you to the next one and it shows you what to press and then it shows you the name of the keyboard shortcut without the keys and sees if you remember and if you remember then you pass that one and if you don't then it keeps cycling you through until you remember it and there are some cool keyboard shortcuts that I'm sure all of us aren't using, but that's certainly true of me. And Mouseless helps you learn how to use these. Very, very cool. I had no idea that this app existed. And I'm already better with Slack based on the, you know, four minutes that I spent messing with it, uh, messing with Mouseless to to learn some new keyboard shortcuts. Like I can move around so much faster in it because I just didn't even know. I didn't like that's how it works, right? You know that these things are there theoretically, but uh, until you start using them, you don't use it. And it's kind of like our automation thing. You know, you can do it the, the the long way, but once you learn how to do it the quick way, then obviously it gets better. So thanks for that, Andrew. Very, very cool. I like, I like mouseless. Had you, did you mess with this yet, John? It's pretty cool. <sighs> Sounds like a drill sergeant. <laughs> no, no, it's fun. It's, it's, it's more, far more fun. Well, I've never experienced a drill sergeant. I mean, I know, I know some drill sergeants, but I've never been sergeanted by them. If that makes any sense. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Tannel tells us about Paperlike, 
Uh, he says it is a screen protector that gives you a paper feeling to the iPad screen. He says, if you're like me and write a lot with Apple Pencil, then this product is very enjoyable. It really feels like writing on a piece of paper with rustling sound as the pencil slides and all. The slightly negative side is that it does make the iPad screen more matte in appearance. On the other hand, it might be useful under direct sunlight to keep reflections from happening. But I do not know yet. He says, as I live in North Europe and there is not much sunlight this time of year. Fair point. So, yeah, there you go. Paperlike.com. And of course, link is in the show notes. I, that, I like that idea with more and more Apple Pencil usage coming out. So that's pretty good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we've got time for more of these things. We'll go to Mike. And Mike says, I wanted to share with you a piece of software that I found a few years ago and have been having have been loving ever since Sighthound, which can be found at sighthound.com. S-I-G-H-T is an NVR network video recording software that can be run on a Mac for recording any network security cameras that you have in your home. It works with most open IP based cameras and has a ton of functionality it says I run nine HD wired cameras around my home uh, from many different vendors. And the app does a great job recording from all of them, bringing them all together, then categorizing the type of movement and alerting me on my phone based on my custom alert settings. It integrates with if and overall is easy to use and configure. He says, I should note that it does not work with closed systems like ring or simply safe, but it complements those systems very well. He says, I use simply safe for my security system and Sighthound for all of my video cameras. I enjoy the open systems because I have tons of options when it comes to cameras. It's a fantastic use case for that old Mac mini that needs a second life. So I wanted to share with the MGG community community so we can all not get caught. Yeah, this is I, I haven't used Sighthound yet, but I started looking into it and it does. It can it can, you know, in basically real time tell you whether the object moving is like a person or a pet or a car and and you know, like he said, you can get alerts based on different things. So that's it's pretty cool. Uh, and, you know, we talk a lot about this with like Synology's surveillance station. But if you don't have a Synology disk station, then you can't use surveillance station because that's what it runs on. Sighthound is is that analog that can just run on your Mac. And then you've got all that stuff and you can connect to it. And like he said, it links with uh, with all the other stuff. That's pretty cool, huh, John? Yeah. Did you say simply safe? I did say simply safe. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I must've talked to them at CES because I got a notification from uh, FedEx that they're sending me something. No, hmm. you got a notification from FedEx because it, well, I, I would, I would think that maybe they might be coming on board as a sponsor, but in, in that they haven't sponsored an oh. episode yet. I couldn't, I certainly couldn't say for sure, but, uh, oh. but yeah. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get the opportunity to check it out ahead of what might or might not be uh, an upcoming sponsorship. Why don't we say that? There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's uh, sometimes how that happens. So yeah, we'll get to check that stuff out. I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward I mean, to it. We're always, yeah. people are always sending us stuff. It's so. true. It's true. Sometimes I'm not sure where it came from. <laughs> Just same. Oh, very much the same. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's times when, you know, FedEx or UPS or even U S postal service shows up and it's like, what is this? And who sent it? And then it's nice when I get to open the box and it's not some piece of junk, which is quite frankly, most of the surprises that I get, i.e., the things that I don't know are coming that people just decide to send are usually things that never even make it into the consideration for cool stuff found folks, because you know, we don't like to tell you about junk. So yeah. All right. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to do uncool stuff found. No, we are not <laughs> be a terrible show. Well, maybe that could be a fun show. Just beating on things. Uh, if you folks want to hear things that are terrible, <laughs> I, I always, you know, as I, as I, as I advised as the, the advice I offered to, to Neil Young, I would, is the advice that I've always followed here is focus on the positive. But, but if you folks want to hear us like rag on, pro I don't know that I really want to do that, but let us know. Maybe, maybe there's a way to do it positively. I don't know. Well, you ragged on Neil Young. So, yeah. right. Well, on, man, Neil, you're on a roll. Neil, Neil. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was a departure, but it needed to kind of be like, it needed to be compartmentalized because 
because I don't, I don't want people thinking the thing like he's, he's spouting these untruths. Um, let us know feedback at MacGeekab.com. And even if you didn't like my rant about Neil Young and you say, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that stuff on the show. Yeah, that's fine. Tell me. Yeah, I don't care. It's but fine. if you want to rant, you could send something to feedback at MacGeekab.com or even feedback at MacGeekab.com. We get stuff to all of those addresses. Uh, Taryn writes, he says, uh, and uh, along the same lines as Mike. He says, I have, uh, he says, I know that you guys have messed with, uh, so, so, uh, easy for me to say 800 episodes, still can't say the words, uh, Synology surveillance station. Uh, and he says, I have one too. And I've been thinking of setting it up for myself. The list of supported cameras on these, uh, is mind boggling. He says, I'm fine. I'm definitely feeling like this is too much choice. I have access to power in various locations that are currently used for outside lights, and can pull data cable if necessary. My Wi-Fi is currently set up um, with a distributed system. He's, he's doing it with an old airport base station and several um, extremes with wired backhaul. But So quasi-mesh system, plenty of coverage. He says, I'm looking for three or four reasonably priced cameras that I can mount on the exterior of my house with good picture quality and low light performance. Uh, that would be a high priority. Any help in choosing IP-based cram cameras? So... Yeah, Taryn, I, I'm kind of with you on this, and and I would love to hear from all of you folks, Mike, especially like what cameras you're using. Uh, I've I've messed with some of these IP based cameras. The thing is, most name brand cameras these days don't offer IP support, so you're kind of stuck using some you know quote unquote off brand camera. Uh, D Link used to support direct IP access in their cameras, but at least for now, they have stopped that. I, I chatted with them at CES and they don't seem to have any interest in reopening that door. They said it caused them a lot of support issues and no one really used it. And I can certainly attest to their support issues. They they were doing silly things with with the camera in terms of it becoming a DHCP server at the wrong times. And that was really bad if you rebooted your router and suddenly your camera started handing out IP addresses to all your devices. That was no bueno. Um, but, uh, I told him, I said, you know, there are a lot of people that use, you know, either Synology uh, surveillance station or the QNAP one or something like Sighthound that would love to have, you know, a name brand company. And they're like, Oh, we never really thought about that. I'm like, okay, well maybe they will. Uh, in the interim, the only brands that are like brands we've heard of that I've used are ubiquity who makes like the unify and actually I have, it won't make it into today's cool stuff found, but I think next week I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts about the new unified dream machine. Uh, but you know, ubiquity with amplify and all that stuff, they make IP cameras that, uh, that are really uh, probably what you want here, Taryn, because they make lots of different options. They understand outdoor wiring and you know, all of that stuff. So that might be something to think about. And then FOSCAM, F-O-S-C-A-M, uh, are kind of, I would call them the sort of the leaders of the, the off-brand camera. I mean, they're not off-brand, but he, I think you get what I'm saying. They, they, they're they definitely reliable. They're cool. I've got one of their cameras in the house, and it's great. Uh, you can pan and zoom with it. It's got a motor in it and all of that stuff, and it's really handy. We actually have it trained on um, in on the room where Hector, uh, that Hector D. Bird on Twitter, uh, lives now i don't have the camera streaming to t twitter or anywhere that any of you would see because it's a camera inside my house so uh, you know access to that is is very tightly controlled as you might imagine but it was handy like lucas and i went to a hockey game i don't know a couple of weeks ago and as we got to the game i'm like dude we forgot to close hector's cage and he's like oh crap now she's usually pretty good she'll stay in her cage and chill especially if the lights are off or whatever but it was really nice because i could check on her you know frequently with the camera and um and, you know and be able to see so but the the foss cam stuff is good so i would i would look at that i would look at i'd really take a look at the ubiquity stuff especially based on you know the the use cases that you're looking for taryn but if anybody's got any recommendations uh for you know ip based cameras let us know that would be that would be good um, yeah, the nice thing is that if you want to see an exhaustive list of all the cameras, they have, uh, Synology has a list. Cool. And, uh, and uh, I already pasted a link to that thing, uh, in our show notes. Cool. 
Um, yeah, a lot of the brands I've never heard of, though they, they do mention the two that you mentioned. So, okay. but uh, yeah, if you want an exhaustive list of IP cameras, uh, that's probably a good place to go. Yeah. So I'm really excited, John, about a new app that's finally available for the Mac. And it is from Mackie, the audio company that makes mixers, among other things. We've talked uh, in the show on the past about Mackie's digital mixers. In fact, this is one of the first places I think that did anybody ever talked about their digital mixers when they first came out with them. And when they first came out with them and really up until fairly recently, you had to use an iPad or an iOS device to control them. Uh, their master fader app was only available for iOS and, you know, slowly they rolled it out to Android, but it took a while. Uh, very recently, just past couple of days, Mackie released master fader 5.1, which now is available for Mac OS and windows. Uh, and it adds some other features too to the mixers that have existed for years, which is so cool. You know, being able to like add the new effects engines and stuff that it's got. But um, but to be able to run and manage your mixer from your Mac is really kind of handy, you know, for some for uh, a lot of folks. That's what they would use to mix from. But even if not, you know, being able to connect to it and set things up from your Mac instead of having to do it from your iPad or whatever can be way easier. So uh, so I'm really, really stoked to finally have master fader available for my Macs. I've long been a fan of Mackie's digital mixers. They're reliable. They sound really good. They've got exactly the right feature set, which is always expanding, which is even better for, you know, live mixing. And also, you know, their newer ones, their newer mixers are, are great uh, recording interfaces too. So you can use them both live and in the studio to record. And especially with that, being able to really control it with the Mac is so cool. And I'm, I'm really stoked that they did this. It, there was a lot of question as to whether or not it would ever actually happen. And so I'm, I'm really happy that it has happened. So check that out too. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And I think we will wrap this show up talking about audio, specifically calling back to a topic in the last show. Um, where a listener was looking for a way, listener John was looking for a way to get audio from the mixing console, but really it doesn't matter what the source is, but you know, in his environment, he has a, it's a church and they have, you know, a mixing console and then the main hall that where they mix the sound, but they want to take what's coming out of the speakers there and run it to speakers in a room that's 75 yards away so that those people can also hear the service or whatever's going on. And so we got into this discussion of how to do audio long range and we really didn't come up with any perfect answers. And there are a couple that you folks have come up with that I wanted to share. And the first uh, comes from listener Gordon who suggests the Bose sound touch. Uh, he says Bose makes standalone sound touch speakers that they could use. Uh, and these are Wi-Fi speakers. So in, and the way that it works is Bose also makes the sound touch wireless link adapter that works over Wi-Fi. So the adapter has an aux in and an audio out and, uh, and you would plug the, uh, one side of this in to the aux in and uh, from the from the mixer and then, you know, wherever you need to. On the other side, you use the other half of this that has the audio out and then it works over Wi-Fi. And this might be the ma the magic answer because it's one hundred and forty nine bucks. But uh, but it's got kind of the pieces that that you would need. The problem is it doesn't seem to be easily available so but it, but you might be able to find it um you know actually I, well i know amazon has it today so it's 149 at, at amazon and this might this might do it so we will uh we will see if in fact this is it i think you'd need i don't think it's a, a pair of them i think you'd need to buy two of them and of course the question is i haven't used these uh, but the question is, would it once you get it configured, would it remain set up sort of forever? So for 300 bucks plus a speaker, not the most inexpensive path to take, but certainly 
uh, seems like worth investigating. So thank you, Gordon, for that. And and like Gordon said, Bose also has um, their own uh, standalone sound touch speakers. So maybe you get one of these things for the input and then just link it to the speaker. So he says the audio at the destination will have a delay from the source because of the fact that it's over a wireless link, but that might not matter. So, and he says he also is not sure that the sound touch line is being actively developed. So that might be, but still a solution that works, works. David takes us a little bit more open source. I'll say, um, he says a workaround that I just recently installed to my church soundboard was to plug in an FM transmitter dialed into a dead channel into the headphone monitor out of the soundboard to create an FM broadcast of the audio out signal. Then you can place an FM, FM receiver, a boom box, or really anything you like anywhere on the church property and tune to the specified channel. He says the quality isn't perfect, but it does allow the nursery staff in his scenario and a couple overflow rooms to hear the exact same audio played over the main house speakers. So that's pretty cool. He didn't offer any FM transmitter, um, the sp- you know, specific FM transmitters to, to use. But, you know, depending on the like for personal use, you can't broadcast a very strong signal. But like he said, you know, you probably can get something that's strong enough to do on the church ground. So I kind of like that idea because because it's open source, John. You know, you're not you're not trapped into a, hmm. a specific system. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's pretty good. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, sure. All right. And then uh, Robert wraps us up here uh, and he says, I recently learned about a professional digital audio software architecture. It's sort of a software and hardware architecture called Dante, D-A-N-T-E. Uh, and, and I've used Dante before. Uh, he says it's used to switch and manage audio on professional studios and live productions over Ethernet cables. It doesn't use your Ethernet network, but it does use Ethernet cables to transmit the audio. He says it provides isochronous magic to keep audio in sync. And although one company controls the tech, it's widely licensed and used. And he's right about that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, for the church, he said uh, the challenge of remote audio connection, I would geek out and run Ethernet instead of analog speaker wires or XLR cables, then experiment with some Dante gear. I would actually turn that around. I would experiment with some Dante stuff before you run the cable, make sure it's going to work for you. And he put a, he gave us a link to a company that seems to have all the necessary endpoint devices named Audinate. And so I will, um, I will put that in the, uh, in the show notes here so that we can, so that, you know, if you, if you're interested in this path, you can, you can check it out. So, yeah, I've used Dante for, you know, in, in installations with mixing consoles and stuff. And it's fantastic because because of what it can do and sending all kinds of audio data over just one single Ethernet cable makes a huge difference. Uh, you don't have to run snakes and, you know, it's not it's not a disaster, which is you know, with a zillion wires or thick wires that you need to worry about. It's just an Ethernet cable. So that's yeah, pretty good. Uh, so now you got three options and I feel like that's, you know, that's where, um, well, that's where this particular episode finds its home. I think John, I think we are, we are finished with, uh, with 800 of these crazy things that we call Mac geek gab. I don't know. It's amazing. 800 more. I'm ready. Yeah, man. I, I have no, you know, it was interesting waking up this morning. It was a couple of weeks ago that somebody pointed out like, uh, it's one of my friends at Yamaha. They're like, hey, you know, you got episode 800 coming up. It's like, what? Oh, <laughs> holy crap. Like, that's true. And I was like, well, what do we do to celebrate 800? I'm like, I-, I don't know. Like I said at the beginning of the episode, let's just do what we do. Everybody's into this. So we just keep rolling. That's kind of, the, to me, that's the, I don't know. It's the best, the best testament to what we can do is th- th- what the show's evolved into and, and, uh, Everybody's into it. So thank you, though, uh, for 800 episodes of all of this. It's fantastic. We are very it it is not lost on us how fortunate we are to be able to do this. And that really does kind of drive us to to, you know, put in the time and make sure that we're doing the best we can for 
for all of us and, and really focused on that goal of all of us learning because that's I think that's the key to this this whole thing here is the 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 fact that, that it really is just about learning stuff that's and and trying to focus on the positive my my rant about Neil Young perhaps perhaps that's mm-hmm. the uh, that, that that's the the indulgence that, that for me anyway in, in this episode was, was that but hopefully that was valuable to folks out there too if not, then thank you for the indulgence. And John, your new laptop. That's a heck of, that's a way better celebration of 800 episodes. I like that the best. That's killer, man. you got, you got a fast machine with a, a motor that's clean. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, hey, you know, I figure every, uh, every eight years or so I should update my laptop. You know, it, th- like you say that, and and I, I mean, I, I get the, the and, and appreciate the self-deprecation there, but but that's like that's the right amount of time these days. Like laptops and machines in general tend to have that seven to ten year lifespan. Um, and what's weird is those machines that we bought ten years ago uh, were bought when computers had to be replaced every three years. It, you know, and so it just it, for me it was. I don't know, maybe three or four years ago, I started looking around the house. I was like, wait a minute. I, I haven't bought computers in a long time, and I don't need to. I mean, eventually we needed to, and, you know, and that, the, the, hence the, the, rel- the relatively recent upgrades. But, you know, computers, they, 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 they're fast enough for most of us, for most of what we do. And so, like, it wouldn't surprise me if this one lasts you another, whatever, six to ten years. Like, that's... Yeah. Yeah. And the migration was really smooth. Well, the the first time it booted, it actually did come up with a lot of security dialogues. Oh, because I guess it loses that authorization. It, but that, that was a one time thing. Yeah, that's that's something that mm, I don't think Apple got right in Catalina, but we'll leave it at that. But we've we've talked. Enough yeah, it was about asking that. me too many questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get you get, you know, numb to those questions eventually and you just start hitting. Yes, yes, yes. And hmm, I don't know that I like that. So. Yeah, and there was only one weird hiccup, but but I was able to fix it. But uh, I stat menus, so actually when it first came up, it showed me all eight cores, and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't want to see all eight cores. <laughs> but you could have so it I, show I, you all sixteen, man. If you uh, oh wait, if I sh- if you show the hyper, if yeah, you show, yeah, like, yeah, I don't need to see that. That taking up a on bit my twenty seven inch in the it, well here and down in the office. In the office, I have the eight core i nine in my iMac. It's like a whatever the four gigahertz eight core i nine. Whatever the top of the line one you could get in the iMac was uh, this, you know, earlier this year or la- last year, um, and I have it show me all sixteen because why not? I, you know, I've got the I've got the desktop room, I've got the room in my menu bar, so it's like oh, I can I can see it. It's good. Rarely does it even ever. Like, yeah, it's mostly just dark. <laughs> Yeah, the weird thing is that the sensor list didn't show up in iStat menus, and I looked online, and people were like, yeah, just reinstall it, and it'll kind of fix that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, All right. right. Well, that's uh, that's what we got today. So thank you to everybody for 800. Thanks for all your questions, uh, all your help, your tips, all the knowledge that we share. Really, that's what it, uh, th- that's, that's the best part of it. And thanks for your premium contributions, MacGeekab.com slash premium. I know I mentioned it earlier in the show. And really, thanks for everything. And you can follow uh, Hector D. Bird on Twitter uh, at Hector D. Bird. You can follow him at John F. Braun. You can follow me at Dave Hamilton. You can follow the show at MacGeekab. Say hi to Pilot Pete at Pilot Pete. And no, he's not the same Pilot Pete as is on The Bachelor, but that's funny. Uh, and I think he gained like I don't know he said he gained like 500 or 1000 new Twitter followers overnight at one point he's like what happened like oh it's the bachelor guy it's great so you can follow him for the right reasons folks because he's happily married and not on the bachelor and any of that but it is kind of funny uh, you can call us 224-888-GEEK thanks to all of our sponsors oh John if someone were to Four, dial three, three, five. that's right Thanks to all of our sponsors. Of course, the ones from this episode. Make sure to check out zapier.com slash MGG. That's Z A P I E R.com slash MGG. Smilesoftware.com slash podcast for PDF Pen 11. Uh, of course, you know, all of our ongoing sponsors Otherworld Computing, Barebones Software, 
Eero.com slash MGG, Lino.com slash MGG, and more coming, perhaps one that we might have even mentioned earlier in this episode. Thank you so much, everybody. Fun stuff. I can't wait to do another 800 more, or at least another eight, or another 8,000. <sighs> I don't know. John, as you're spending the week with your new MacBook Pro and messing around with it, changing things, tweaking things, experimenting, having all that fun, make a backup first. And that is there so that you don't get caught. Made up. Yeah.